Hello, everyone, and welcome to a live event organized as part of the Miguel Worthy Starter Heart 2021 campaign, a global initiative aiming to empower individuals to respond to cardiac arrest. I want to start by wishing our panelists and our audience a happy Thanksgiving, and thank you all for joining us on that day. Bonjour et bienvenue à un événement en direct organisé dans le contexte de la campagne Miguel Worthy Starter Heart 2021, une initiative mondiale visant à renforcer les capacités des individus à réagir en cas d'arrêt cardiaque. I am David Nassim, a third year medical student at McGill and communications lead of the McGill Where We Start a Heart 2021 campaign. I am joined today by two of our campaign's ambassadors. Dr. Joanie Rochette is a graduate of McGill University, currently pursuing her residency training in anesthesiology. Right before Joanie was scheduled to compete at the 2010 Vancouver Winter Olympics, her mother suddenly passed away of a heart attack. Joanie is sharing with us her story as part of this year's campaign. Welcome, Joanie. Jacqueline Simoneau is a Canadian synchronized swimmer who competed in the 2016 Rio Olympics and at the most recent 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Jacqueline is currently studying podiatric medicine. Welcome, Jacqueline. We have the privilege to be joined as well by Dr. Scott Delaney, an emergency and sports medicine physician. He is the head team physician from the Club de Foot Montréal and chief medical consultant for the National Hockey League's Players Association and for the Cirque du Soleil. Welcome, Dr. Delaney. Joining, joining us as well is Dr. Francois de Champlain, an emergency physician and trauma team leader at the McGill University Health Center and founder of the Jacques de Champlain Foundation. He has been the medical director for many endurance sporting events, such as the Montreal Marathon, the Mont Tremblant Ironman, as well as the Montreal ITU World Triathlon. Dr. de Champlain is one of several emergency and intensive care physicians on our campaign steering committee. Welcome, Dr. de Champlain. Happy to be here. Finally, but not least, we are joined by my colleague, Alexa Ellerbrack, a first-year medical student at McGill and finance lead of the McGill World Heart 2021. Alexa and I will serve as moderators for this event. In the interest of our invited guests and audience, this event will be held bilingually. Joanie demonstrated great courage at the Vancouver Olympics following the passing away of her mother to a heart attack. She has shown immense generosity in sharing with us such a personal event. Please stand by for the premiere of Joanie's story. My mother was uh, my biggest fan. She was a part of my career since I was two years old. Um, we had been through everything together and I felt like going into the Olympic games with her was almost like a shared dream uh, that we had since I was very young. Two days before I was scheduled to compete at the Vancouver Olympics back in 2010, I got a call from my father in the middle of the night to tell me that my mother had passed away of a heart attack. I didn't know she was sick, she was 55 years old, she was healthy, she was my biggest fan, my best friend, and my biggest supporter in my career. Um, that was a a real shock to me. Uh, but when it happened, uh, my father did not know what to do. Um, he was in a state of shock and he just screamed for help. And luckily, uh, my mother's best friend was sleeping in the room next to them. She came in the room and right away she started CPR. Unfortunately, that did not save her, but I'm so grateful that she tried and that she knew what to do. And I feel like everything was done for my mom to try and save her and uh, that could save someone else in the future. Before Vancouver, I thought that uh, heart disease was an old man's disease. I did not know that it could happen to anyone, let alone my mom, who was only 55. My one wish is that people know what to do in these kind of situations. I'm Joanie Rochette, Canadian physician and Olympic figure skater. Joanie, merci beaucoup pour ta générosité, ton courage et pour avoir pris le temps de partager avec nous ton histoire. On espère que les efforts qu'on met dans cette campagne rendront hommage à la mémoire de votre mère. Dr. De Champlain also lost his father, Dr. Jacques De Champlain, to a, to a cardiac arrest while cycling. Thank you, Dr. De Champlain, for your dedication and commitment to the memory of your father. Joanie, euh, lors des Jeux Olympiques de Vancouver en 2010, je me rappelle encore, j'étais cloué sur mon sofa, je regardais, je regardais ça attentivement. Plusieurs athlètes ont livré des performances spéciales, mais il y en a très peu qui avaient une performance avec autant d'émotion euh, puis autant de pouvoir que la tienne. Il y a peu de performances qui sont gravées dans la mémoire des Québécois et des Canadiens comme la tienne. Euh, vous aviez soudainement perdu votre mère et quelques jours plus tard, vous étiez euh, déjà sur la glace. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous parler un peu des émotions que vous aviez alors ressenties 
comment ça s'est passé, puis comment est-ce que vous avez pris la décision finalement que malgré tout ce qui s'est passé, vous allez quand même patiner? C'est fou, Vancouver, ça fait déjà 11 ans, euh, mais je me souviens que quand c'est arrivé sur le coup, euh, c'était un choc pour moi. Euh, je ne pouvais pas croire ce qui était en train d'arriver. Je me demandais si c'était la réalité ou si c'était un rêve. Euh, mais en même temps, toute ma vie, je m'étais préparée pour ce moment-là. Euh, J'étais vraiment chanceuse d'être au Canada quand c'est arrivé, chanceuse dans ma malchance, euh, d'avoir été aussi bien entourée. J'avais euh, une super équipe autour de moi, euh, tout le comité olympique, euh, notre médecin de l'équipe euh, canadienne en patinage artistique, Dr. Euh, Julia Aline, qui j'étais très proche, euh, des amis de la famille aussi qui avaient fait le voyage. Euh, je pense quand on est athlète aussi, en, en tout cas en patinage, ce qui aide, c'est qu'on a la musique, ça nous aide à rester dans le moment présent, puis à ne pas trop penser quand on est en train de faire notre performance. Euh, mais pour être bien honnête avec vous, quand je suis embarquée sur la glace, je me demandais si j'allais être capable de glisser sur un patin. Là. Je ne savais pas comment j'allais faire pour patiner. Euh, mais aussitôt que la musique a débuté, les premières notes, je ne me souviens plus de rien. Je pense que mon corps a juste fait le, euh, le travail, la routine pour laquelle, pour laquelle je m'étais entraînée. Euh, la décision s'est comme prise par elle-même dans le sens où je savais que je voulais le faire, je savais que c'était la bonne décision, je savais que ma mère voudrait que je le fasse quand même. Euh, puis j'avais l'appui de, de tous les Canadiens qui étaient là. Je pense que ça m'a ça porté un peu là, pendant cette semaine-là. Euh, à ce moment-là, je ne pensais plus vraiment à une médaille. Je voulais juste faire ma routine, participer au jeu. Euh, puis honorer un peu la mémoire de ma mère parce qu'elle faisait partie de, de ma carrière. Puis c'est elle qui, qui a fait en sorte que ce soit possible. Euh, tous les camps d'entraînement, euh, les compétitions, trouver des commanditaires, c'était comme ma secrétaire, ma meilleure amie. Euh, c'était ma, ma plus grande fan aussi. Euh, mais oui, je pense que j'ai été vraiment chanceuse d'avoir une aussi bonne équipe qui m'ont aidé, qui m'ont appuyé là-dedans, euh, puis d'avoir été au Canada. En tout cas, tu as certainement bien honoré la mémoire de ta mère. Ton histoire est très, très respirante. Yeah. Um, after your Olympic career, as we all know, you actually traded your skate for a stethoscope and you started medical school. Um, we were wondering if this event, uh, what happened in Vancouver, played a role in your decision to become a doctor and uh, how did this experience as well help shape the physician that you are today? Um, I always wanted to study medical school, so it's not necessarily what happened in Vancouver that made me decide to go into medicine. Uh, my mother was a PAB, so I think I was always um, into healthcare and wanting to help people. But also being an athlete, I was always curious about the human body, um, learning how it works. Whenever I would get injured, I would want to understand a bit more what was going on in my body. Um, so the idea of studying it in more detail, of studying medicine, um, was uh, very appealing to me. And of course, after what happened in Vancouver, I, I felt even more drawn to it. Um, I wanted to promote a healthy lifestyle. Um, that's, that's pretty much uh, why I went into medicine, but it was challenging. Um, it's not like skating. Of course, when you're an athlete, you have the discipline, the dedication, but spending uh, 10 hours a day sitting instead of training is very different. Um, And, but, but I don't regret it. I mean, it's been a very um, interesting um, for seven years so far. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very, also I, I'm very grateful to have a, an opportunity to do something else. Uh, skating was a big, big part of my life. And I think a lot of athletes after their uh, career kind of feel there's a void uh, to fill. And, Medicine definitely filled that void because so many hours are spent um, studying for exams, uh, doing your rotations at the hospital, as you know. Um, so it, it kind of helped in that way too. And now that I'm a, a resident, uh, I, it's challenging every day, but at the same time, I feel very lucky to be able to do uh, something that I love. Well, your story is an inspiration to all of us. Uh, thank you very much, Joanie, for sharing your wisdom and your experience.
So uh, next up, we have Dr. Delaney. And uh, as introduced earlier by David, Dr. Delaney supervises the care of many professional athletes, notably the athletes of the Montreal FC and Cirque du Soleil. So Dr. Delaney, do you think you could give us some insight pertaining to the screening and maintenance of athletes' cardiovascular health during the preseason, as well as as the season goes on? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, so, well, thank you again for having me. Most of the work in terms of cardiovascular screening happens at the pre-participation physicals where really we're very proactive. A lot of the time during the season, you're reactive and sort of reacting to an injury or what have you. This is the one time where we try to think ahead and make sure that it's safe for the athlete to participate. Um, and one of the things that we take very seriously is trying to screen people who might be at risk for cardiovascular disease. And, and our worst case scenario is cardiovascular death, where a young healthy athlete just drops on the ice or on the field of play. Um, and perhaps very unsophisticated, most of the screening is really based on history and asking athletes have they experienced certain symptoms that get our attention, such as sudden loss of consciousness during exercise, chest pain during exercise, palpitations during exercise and a family history of sudden death um, because many of the conditions that we look out for tend to run in families. So it, can, it, it honestly is like finding a needle in a haystack in that we, we do our best, but it's a very difficult thing to, to find. You know, when you hear about an athlete who's passed away um, due to some cardiovascular sudden event, they've probably had dozens of pre-participation physicals in their lives and through no fault of, of anybody's because these things can progress, um, we still miss it and, and they, they can unfortunately drop dead. Um, so a big part of it is based on the history. Um, most teams will ask for an EKG um, and obviously a physical examination. And then, then you start to see differences. Some leagues ask for ultrasounds of the heart or echocardiograms um, every one to two years. And, you know, the problem with these things is it's not like a pregnancy test. It's not positive or negative. A lot of the, the, the testing in athletes is abnormal from a regular person. So their EKGs, for example, look abnormal because they just have bigger hearts. So you sort of scratch your head and say, wait, wait, is that normal or is that, you know, something pathologic? And the same thing with ultrasounds. Athletes tend to have bigger, thicker hearts. And that's one of the things we look out for. So then you say, well, is this normal? You know, is it too abnormal or is it just normal for an athlete? And, you know, what we're seeing more frequently now is that, um, you know, we've gone from the history to the physical, to the EKG, to the ultrasound, and now we're moving to cardiac MRIs. You know, more and more often we're moving to do that. And, and if you've ever seen when a cardiac MRI is actually like a movie of the heart, playing as it contracts and you can see the different things. And, and that's about the best test we have. So every year we see a few more and a few more and a few more, and it's certainly becoming the wave of the future. But, you know, pre-participation exams are really when we are proactive and try to look out for these type of things. Awesome. Thank you so much. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, yeah, kind of tying into what you just mentioned, we all uh, saw the sudden cardiac arrest of uh, Christian Erickson in the 2020 Euro. And, uh, you know, I think this event clearly shows and reminds us that sudden cardiac arrest can really happen to anyone, even professional athletes. And um, and, uh, you know, I was wondering if you could maybe talk to us about the generality of the MLS, CFL and NHL protocols and the requirements on the sidelines to rapidly intervene. So if this ever were to happen during one of the games, what's the what's the kind of protocol? What would you guys do? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, a lot of people, a lot of leagues mandate that you have to have an emergency medicine specialist there um, because we tend to be the best at managing things in the first few minutes. Um, and you have to have unobstructed access. You can't have the emergency physician sitting up in the media booth at a hockey rink and then having to take the elevator down and work his way through the hot dog stands and get out onto the ice. So they have to have very quick uh, access to that. And all of the leagues mandate that. And they have different requirements about how many doctors have to be present at each game. 
Um, but all of them have to have a qualified emergency physician at the game. And, you know, one of the things that is brought home by the Christian Erickson uh, unfortunate event is you know, nobody likes to, it, it, as many times as you do it, it's always uncomfortable to be out on a field in front of thousands of people doing this stuff. But what we've learned is you have to do it right there and now. You cannot, I don't care how uncomfortable you are, you cannot take the time to sort of stretch her up and, you know, I, gosh, I'd rather do this inside where nobody's watching or what have you. It, what we've really tried to hammer home is for the people covering events is you have to deal with that right there on the field of play. You don't have time to take them off into the, the back room. You don't have time to take them off into the hallway. You've got to start CPR and you've got to get a defibrillator on them and you've got to defibrillate them right there on the 50 yard line of a football game if that's what needs to be done. And then you can move them on. And that's not something that many people are comfortable with, but it is in the absolute best interest of the athletes and improving their chances for survival. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, just like uh, Erickson, we actually hear a lot about like marathon runners, athletes and other fit young individuals having cardiac arrest during sports. And uh, a common question is, is there any advice you give to athletes who train a lot? So are breaks important? Should they be resting their heart? Uh, is there a way we can tell if, you know, they're pushing themselves too hard? I think it depends on which type of athlete you're talking about. Um, for the recreational athlete who's doing this for health reasons, you know, they, we, we tell them the same things. You know, you look out for chest pain, you look for, for heaviness on your chest, palpitations. You look out for shortness of breath that seems out of proportion to what you're doing. And it may be getting worse over time as you continue to exercise. That's different than, let's say, an elite marathoner or, or an elite uh, triathlete who really are about performance uh, and they push themselves beyond the limit. And, and it's not a health thing, it's a performance issue. So, you know, Francois it, it certainly knows about this looking after the marathons that, you know, you take people who are pushing themselves, you bring them in and whatever, they have some problem, you bring them into the hospital, you do blood tests, it shows their, their, the blood tests for their heart are elevated. You know, they put in, in a normal circumstance, if somebody was sitting at home watching television, and they had chest pain, and they came in with those blood tests, we think, well, you know, you seem to be having angina or having a heart attack. Well, wait, no, no. Actually, I was just finishing up the Montreal Marathon and really pushing myself. Then we'd say, okay, well, that's within normal limits to a certain degree. For most people in terms of rest, you know, the heart is one of many organs that requires rest and rehabilitation. You know, if you do something like the Ironman in Hawaii, you're sore for days to weeks in terms of your muscles, tendons, you know, if you're really dehydrated, your kidneys don't work well. So you have to take a break regardless. You know, you're almost limited by the other organs than you are the heart. So it sort of takes care of itself in terms of rest and recovery from a cardiac point of view in terms of returning to exercise, because so many other things are sore and are recovering that you're preoccupied with uh, as opposed to your heart. Right. That makes sense. Dr. Delaney, thank you so much for your time and for answering our questions. <laughs> You're welcome. Our next question is for Jacqueline. Uh, Jacqueline, the Tokyo Games, they occurred just two weeks following the Euros. And we were wondering, following what happened to Ericsson, everyone saw it. Um, was this event uh, ever discussed within Team Canada at Tokyo? Uh, for example, did the, did the Christian Ericsson uh, event push you to uh, be more aware of doing CPR? Did you have to undergo a certain training to be able to react more promptly if ever something were to happen while you were performing? Great question. So prior to heading out to the Olympic Games, we were obviously sent a protocol that was in place mostly for COVID. However, um, once this event occurred at the Euros, it raised the awareness between myself and my teammates to start posing some questions to our medical staff. Um, because as much as it's a rare event and it's not always associated with an underlying cause of, um, you know, cardiac pathology, you know, it could happen to anybody. So that thought was definitely in the back of our mind. And yes, we do undergo screenings from year to year. Um, as Dr. Jelani mentioned, uh, we answer thorough questionnaires. We are going through an EKG once a year. And as much as we are screened, 
Um, none of this could really prevent or predict what could happen at the Olympic Games. So um, our screening is quite complex. And what really reassured us is the response from our Team Canada, Team Canada medical staff, um, where they explained to us the protocols that were in place. Everybody who was on the field to play with us was fully trained um, and was actually aware of where all these defibrillators were placed in our big sports complex because my sport and artistic swimming, we have a lot of Olympic sized swimming pools. And so it's one thing to run across a hundred meter swimming pool. By the time you run back with that, um, if it's in two Olympic swimming pools away, you might not get there in time. And so um, they ensure that there were defibrillators in place at strategic places throughout the Olympic swimming pools. And so these were all things that really reassured us while heading into the Olympic games. That's great to know. Et euh, en tant qu'athlète d'autres performances, encore une fois à la suite de ce qui s'est passé en 2020 à l'Euro, est-ce que tu t'es senti un peu visé par l'événement d'Ericsson, étant toi-même une athlète, Ericsson un athlète, comme tu disais tantôt, on réalise que ça peut arriver à n'importe qui. Donc je me demandais, est-ce que ça peut causer une certaine sorte d'anxiété avant d'aller performer? Certainement. C'est sûr que notre mission en tant qu'athlète, c'est vraiment juste de performer le mieux possible. Mais cet événement-ci avec Christian Ericsson, ça nous a laisser des questions dans la derrière notre tête. On ne veut pas vraiment avoir des questions, des hésitations pendant qu'on performe, même si euh, c'est un événement rare, mais ça peut quand même arriver à tout le monde. Alors, ce que nous avons fait, euh, moi et mes coéquipières, on a posé des questions à notre équipe médicale pour savoir quelles sortes de protocoles sont en place si jamais quelque chose comme ça peut arriver euh, chez nous. Comme j'ai mentionné précédemment, euh, on a beaucoup de protocoles en place de chaque année euh, pour avoir un petit peu de screening sur le background de chaque athlète. Alors, un petit peu comme Dr. Denarny l'a mentionné, à chaque année, on passe des EKGs. Euh, et même à chaque deux à trois ans, on a aussi des ultrasons de notre corps et de notre cœur. Et on voit aussi que nos, nos cœurs sont un petit peu anormales à comparer de monsieur, madame, tout le monde. Alors, déjà, en cherchant ça derrière notre tête, ça nous a mené à poser ce type de questions-là à notre équipe médicale. Alors, à Tokyo, oui, il y avait beaucoup de précautions liées avec la COVID, mais spécifiquement avec la rue cardiaque, on a posé des questions avec, ben, c'est qui qui serait là avec nous, qui a la formation pour, pour nous aider, euh, puis où est-ce qu'on peut avoir accès des, à des défibrateurs. Alors, on a vraiment vu... Um, que ces protocoles-là étaient ajoutés, étaient très bien expliqués à nous. Alors, quand, quand on était en train de performer à Tokyo, on n'avait pas ces doutes-là dans notre tête. Well, that's very interesting. You're giving us insight how everything happens in the Olympic Village. These are stuff that we don't usually see, so thank you very much. Um, comme okay, je disais, uh, on est tous très, très honorés d'avoir la chance d'échanger avec nos athlètes nationaux. Jacqueline, Joannie, on est très fiers de vous. Puis encore une fois, merci beaucoup de nous, de nous donner uh, uh, de l'information par rapport à comment ça se passe uh, de votre côté. Awesome. So uh, next up, we have some questions for you, uh, Dr. Deschamplain. So uh, Dr. Deschamplain, uh, just like Joanne, you lost a loved one due to cardiac causes, actually sudden cardiac arrest, uh, your father, he passed away while cycling. Um, and now has this event played a role in your willingness to cycle or undergo any particular sport? Yes, of course, it, uh, it, it had an impact on myself. Uh, my father was um, a, a physician working in the, uh, you know, mainly as a researcher in the cardiovascular field. Um, so he knew a lot more uh, than myself about cardiovascular disease, prevention strategies, uh, definitely aware of symptoms. Um, so, you know, when uh, in July 2009, he went on this, um, you know, bicycle ride, As far as I know, that was his first symptoms of his life. And that happens, like we think this happens about like 50% of the time that actually the first symptoms of maybe an underlying cardiac disease is actually cardiac arrest. So, um, you know, it's very difficult to catch everyone that is potentially at risk because sometimes there's no warning flags. But for myself to come back to the question, It, it definitely, you know, as you know, whenever we are in our professional life, I grew up doing a lot of sports. I think I was very active as a child, uh, always enjoyed team and individual sports. 
Um, but, you know, when this happened, I realized that for a few years with my bu busy professional life, uh, you know, the thing in my schedule that was usually being pushed would be my uh, exercise or sporting activities sometimes that I just couldn't fit in my schedule. And uh, after his uh, passing away in 2009, shortly afterwards, I had heard about this interval training program um, with indoor cycling, um, and I committed to it. And um, since 2009, I've been doing it at least three times a week um, and, and um, you know, really having fun doing that both indoor and outdoor. Uh, met a lot of people, um, you know, embarking myself in cycling clubs and uh, ended up doing uh, triathlons as well, just for fun, because uh, I have no specific goals of performance. Um, you know, we'll talk a bit about, about that a bit later, I think, but uh, you don't have to do uh, to register for an Ironman or a marathon to actually stay active and, uh, and, and you know, really use the sport to help you decrease your cardiovascular risk. So the American Heart Association recommends 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exertion or 75 minutes a week of more intense, uh, vigorous uh, physical exertion. So if you think about it and, and you, you really target the moderate uh, intensity, that's 30 minutes a day, five times a week. And uh, even in our busy schedule, uh, I think we can all achieve that. Uh, but my advice is really to put it in your agenda the same as you would for any other meetings so that you commit to it and you follow it and you continue it and you don't let go after a few weeks. That's really, that's excellent advice. Thank you so much. And uh, now I think, uh, I think a lot of people maybe aren't aware, um, you know, what are some signs of impeding heart trouble? So while we're playing sports or uh, if we're not athletes and we're just, you know, exercising, like you said, for our cardiovascular health, what are some things that we should take notice of, some symptoms that we should be worried about? When should we say, okay, maybe I need to go see uh, my doctor for this? Well, my first recommendation will be that if you're middle age or if you have like any medical condition that you're not sure if it puts you at risk because you haven't done sport regularly and suddenly middle age, you restart doing sports, instead of going all out is really first to have a trainer, go gradually, probably meet with your physician to see if doing it puts you at risk. And to discuss most of the time, as uh, my colleague, Dr. Delaney mentioned, it doesn't necessarily lead to certain tests, but a good questionnaire, medical questionnaire, maybe a physical exam, um, and maybe some basic screenings that sometimes, as we mentioned, can be misleading. And they're not always the way to go for the general population to have all sorts of tests prior to an event. But your physician that knows your history is the best person to know if it puts you at any risk to start like a regular exertion, uh, exercise program. Um, my second advice afterwards is really to do it gradually, as I mentioned, and, and during the activity is really to pay attention of your, um, your symptoms. And really, I've seen this as a former medical director of different endurance um, uh, events you know, during race day, people push themselves and sometimes they just don't listen to their warning symptoms. Uh, if you never experience different symptoms in training, maybe this is a red flag. Um, as Dr. Delaney mentioned, for me, the two most important symptoms are chest pain while you're having exertion and also the feeling of, of maybe passing out or losing consciousness doing sports. This is not normal. This should always be a reason in any in training or during a race to stop and immediately seek medical attention because uh, those are not normal feelings. The other symptoms such as shortness of breath and more sweating or palpitations are sometimes more difficult to gauge while you're doing a physical activity. But obviously, if they're out of proportion to what you felt, those are also red flags. 
Makes sense. Thank you. So, um, you know, as an emergency physician and a trauma team leader, you lead resuscitations all the time, I would say maybe even daily. Um, so what advice do you have for people at home if, uh, you know, they're a bystander at home to someone who's undergoing a sudden cardiac arrest or just out on the street, at school, at work, wherever it may be? What, what advice do you have to them for them? Well, I will start by answering uh, that I've, I've been doing now um, emergency physician for quite some time. I won't, I won't say how many years, um, but um, I've been in this business long enough to have seen like a great evolution in the way we run resuscitation within the walls of the hospitals. We use different strategies. Uh, as mentioned, we, we use a lot more like the, uh, you know, ultrasound during our resuscitation to guide our therapy. We look at the heart. We do, uh, we use like heart lung machines called ECMO, even during cardiac arrest or profound shock. Um, and despite all this for cardiac arrest, really our survival to hospital discharge hasn't grudged that much. And it that's plateaued pretty much at 10%. And the reason for that, the main reason for that is that we're limited by the first actions that are not done enough, meaning the use of CPR and a defibrillator, an AED, prior to the arrival of the paramedics or the first responders. Until we tackle this and those numbers go up, for example, right now for an AED is only used one time out of five prior to the EMS arrival and cardiac arrest and CPR is done less than one time out of two prior to uh, the arrival of the emergency medical services. We can do collectively better than this. And if we do better than this by different strategies, uh, we will see a great rise because we've improved so much in the hospital. If those first few steps are done, then what we do in the hospital will translate and increase survival to hospital discharge with good neurologic function. So people that can go back to work and do their activities and enjoy life with a good quality of life. Awesome, thank you. And a follow-up question for you. Uh, uh, if you're in just in your neighborhood in Montreal and you know, um, heaven forbid something happens uh, to a relative, a roommate, a friend, uh, and the ambulance is, you know, five, 10 minutes away, you want to maybe find an AED, for example. A lot of people don't know where to find them. Where, where would I go to look for one? Where, where are some common places I could find one? What would I, how would I find one? <laughs> so, um, you know, the first thing to always do is call 911 after you recognize um, you know, that there is uh, someone in cardiac arrest. And sometimes that can be tricky because some people may have certain breathing that we call agonal breathing. So the first thing is quick recognition uh, of, of the person not breathing normally and likely in cardiac arrest. And then to immediately call 911. Sometimes the person answering the 911 will be able to direct you to the closest uh, AED if they have that information. Um, if not, you can download uh, an app, uh, a free app on your smartphone, either Android or, or um, uh, you know, uh, iOS, uh, Apple Store. You can download AD Quebec, Udea Quebec. Uh, it is simply a, a free app that tells you where the nearest AD is. And you can then, while someone is actually starting compressions, really simple, just compression, middle of the chest, dominant hand first, and compressing at a rate of about 100 per minute. Uh, you can use the song in your head of staying alive of the Bee Gees that many of us know to direct your compression. And you send someone to go and retrieve the AD and bring it back. And really afterwards, you just listen to what the AD is saying because the voice instruction will guide you through the process and decide if a shock is needed or not. And some of the machine will even deliver the shock without having to do anything. Others, they'll just tell you to press shock uh, on the button. So uh, the, the main thing, as I mentioned before, is not to hesitate to act, even if you have no previous training in this. It's been shown that even sixth graders without previous training can do this as, as quickly almost as trained paramedics. 
Great, thank you so much. That's really good to know about uh, about the app. I definitely suggest uh, everyone download it if they have uh, if they're able to. It's a great app. Um, so thank you so much for your responses. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So um, our next question is going to be uh, for Dr. Joanie Rochette. Uh, a lot of a lot of people are scared to perform CPR. They often think that they might for example, do more damage than good. What message do you have for them? I'm especially interested in your answer since you're now in the anesthesiology. Um, well, I guess I already talked uh, already. It's very important to start right away if you notice someone without a pulse uh, to start CPR. Uh, in my uh, experience with my mother, uh, my father was scared to do it because he, he had never done it. He, was never taught how to do it. Um, but my, my mother's best friend uh, was in the, the room next door and she had followed a, a small uh, formation and she knew basics of CPR and she felt confident enough to do it. Um, so I think it's important for people to understand that. Uh, yes, you can maybe break a rib, but that's a, at that point, it's the least of your concern. Uh, the important is to start pumping blood uh, in the person's body so that they can uh, oxygenate their brain. Um, it can be intimidating, so that's why I think it's important to put it in various programs, maybe even teach kids in school uh, how to do it so that they grow up, they grow older, uh, not being uh, scared to do it. Um, and yes, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I think I think you bring a great point. Having it taught at school is, is should would be very uh, effective. Maybe we should uh, try and uh, push that as much as we can. It will come in Quebec uh, very soon. That's great. That's great. Awesome. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rachette. Uh, so now we've reached uh, kind of the question and answer part of our event. So we're taking questions uh, from anyone who's watching the event live. If you guys have any questions, uh, you can write them in into the chat and we'll see them. Um, and my next question is for uh, Dr. Delaney. So Dr. Delaney, what would you say to individuals who are scared to use an AED? So we talked now about where we can find them. Let's say we have the AED, a lot of people are scared to use them. They're scared that it's going to do more damage, like giving a shock, for example, if a person doesn't actually need a shock. And a lot of people are scared that this will, will hurt their loved ones or, um, or their, the people that they're encountering on the street. So what do you, what do you think about that, Dr. Delaney? Um, I think it, if you've never used one or had it in your hands, I absolutely understand the, the fear of thinking, how does this work? And am I gonna shock myself? You know, people have probably on television or in the movies have seen people shocking each other and, and you know. So I absolutely understand it. And I think that the only way to get around that is with education. Um, and it's great to, to hear Francois say that it's coming to schools um, because, you know, if you catch them at an early age where they're receptive to most things that we put in front of them and they grow up with it, um, much like, you know, you go back to bicycle helmets, it's hard to get adults to wear bicycle helmets, but it's much easier to get a four-year-old to wear a bicycle helmet and they grow up their entire lives thinking it's normal. So, you know, early intervention, uh, use of ADs. Um, again, if you've never seen one, I, I, I you know, I, I, don't, I don't sort of want to have an accusing finger towards anybody we see we see them a lot, but if you've never seen one, they are very easy to do use. You cannot sort of shock yourself, but the the, the best thing we can do is is to get the information out there. Um, and and having it taught in schools, boy, that's the base of the pyramid. That's where you get everybody, uh, and they'll grow up with that. So I think that's a great um, intervention and, and plan moving forward. Awesome! Thank you so much. Dr. Delaney, just a follow-up question for you. Uh, just wondering if you ever had to deal, let's say, with athletes who are taking themselves too far with their training, and then uh, what the encounter would be, uh, what kind of advices would you tell them, and are they usually receptive to uh, what we suggest from the medical side of things? Well, like uh, Dr. Duchamplain said, you know, working out to the point of, of passing out, that's not pushing yourself too far. Something is abnormal. 
uh, with that until proven otherwise. We have a lot of athletes who, you know, get into overtraining and, and, you know, fatigue over weeks and months. We've had a lot of athletes who feel that though I push myself so hard that my glucose drops and it's usually not that it's something else, but uh, as Dr. Champlain said, you know, there are red flags of passing out chest pain. You know what? Last week I could do this and now I'm incredibly much more short of breath. Th those are warning signs that sometimes you don't get it, get those warning signs. So you have to take them seriously and, and, and use them to our advantage. Because as I said, there are athletes who are in their thirties, some of them captains of Olympic teams who drop dead. And they may never, they, they may never have had a, a symptom like that, but oftentimes you go back to the history and be like, yeah, you know, here she actually passed out in practice like a month ago and thought it was dehydration and what have you. Maybe it was, but maybe it wasn't. That's just a red flag as Dr. Champlain said to start being investigated. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, I'll leave the floor for my colleague, Alexa. Yeah, uh, Dr. Delaney, actually one more question. Um, so, so basically a lot of people maybe have family histories of uh, sudden cardiac arrest. So for the people who are maybe watching this live stream, uh, what would you, what would you say to them if they think, oh my gosh, you know, my mom passed away of a sudden cardiac arrest, or I have a cousin who was at the gym and he just dropped and he passed away of a sudden cardiac arrest. Is that uh, grounds for them to go to their doctor? What could this mean for them? Could it be genetic? What is yeah, so, I mean, you, you'll often hear um, when you ask those questions, like, wait a minute, my grandfather, you know, passed away, but he was 85 and smoked five packs a day. So most of the things we worry about, um, a lot of them, like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they tend not to progress beyond the age of 40. So you're looking for family history of a cousin who was playing basketball, who just dropped dead. Not, I mean, although it's, not to be discounted, not your 90 year old great aunt um, who, you know, had cardiac problems and who had a, a heart attack. Usually we look for sudden cardiac death in a family member uh, less than 40 years old. Awesome, thank you so much for your answer. <laughs> I have a question now for Jacqueline. So Jacqueline, as an Olympic athlete, what do you think about the common misconception that cardiac problems can only occur in older people? Um, I guess the event of um, Christian Erickson showed us that even if you're the fittest person on the planet, it can still happen to you. Uh, precisely, you've hit it right on the nail. That event just busted that misconception that um, sudden cardiac arrest only happens to the older type of population. It could truly happen to anybody at any moment. Um, and going to, into some further misconceptions that we perhaps get as athletes, something um, that we often are, are scared to disclose some of our symptoms, perhaps you know, some chest pain or that feeling of losing consciousness during exercise because a misconception between athletes is that if you perhaps have a diagnosed heart disease, you won't be able to exercise or achieve your athletic goals. On the, on the contrary, um, it does not mean that you should not exercise. I am not a medical doctor. And so I'm not able to, to, to fully bring out all the facts on this, but these are some misconceptions that are um, discussed between some athletes are perhaps scared or a little bit weary um, when disclosing these types of symptoms. And that's why these some types of symptoms could perhaps get passed away. And that's why these events happen um, out of what seemed like out of the blue. Um, and another misconception, perhaps, is that people should avoid exercise if they, they have heart disease. And again, this is alluding to the fact that, um, on the contrary, having uh, a healthy diet and a good exercise, it's never too early to start, like Dr. Champlain was mentioning earlier on. Um, it only requires a small part in your day throughout the week. Uh, and it's very important to start to schedule that in your day as if it was another Zoom meeting or another class and to start building these healthy habits at a young age to, in a way, already start to build that foundation so that later on um, you're perhaps already into these good habits and don't have to um, go through these types of symptoms. 
Well, thanks for debunking those misconceptions and for pushing us all and motivating us all to exercise more. My pleasure, thanks. All right, uh, Dr. Deschamplain, question for you. Uh, would you be able to walk us through the chain of survival from start to finish? Yeah, so I, I kind of started a bit uh, earlier on uh, with the, uh, so uh, the chain of survival is really, um, you know, a quick mnemonic, um, you know, of a few steps to remember when the, um, the stakes are high and the moments of, uh, uh, of stress of, you know, what you need to do as a bystander. But the chain of survival has evolved over time and now have six links and includes, um, you know, things that uh, are even after the bystander intervention. So the first step, as I mentioned, is early recognition and really call rapid call to the 911. Um, with the best intention, if you just do your other steps and the ambulance really comes later because you forgot to call them earlier, many of the things you've done properly uh, will be uh, counteract a bit by the delayed arrival of, of uh, care to relieve you. Uh, so, uh, and then really it's, uh, it's CPR and CPR has evolved over time. We used to do the mouth to mouth plus the chest compression. Now we know that chest compressions only um, is actually as beneficial, especially done by a bystander. So it's really like pushing hard in the center of the chest, like I mentioned a hundred times a minute um, and really, you know, about five centimeter deep. And like Joanny Rochette um, mentioned earlier on, uh, you know, it is normal that, you know, there may be ribs that are fractured, but this is not like a deal breaker at all. You should just do the compressions and know that you're doing the right thing. Um, and then afterwards is really to use the AD as soon as possible. So, as soon as that person comes back is to attach the pads of the AEDs, just on off and follow the instruction. And even though, you know, it is great if you had a course to demystify the use of uh, the machine, it is so simple to use once you actually open it because there's really two buttons at most, on off and shock. Um, so the rest, the machine will tell you and the machine will not, it's impossible that the machine actually gives a shock if it's not indicated. So the only thing that the machine can achieve is give a, a shock and save a life. So you should never not use it despite the fact that you haven't been trained. But of course, I'm gonna encourage everyone to take a course. And then um, the, the, uh, uh, the fourth link is really the uh, advanced care done usually by the first responders and the paramedics that sometimes we'll use medications such as what we would be using in the hospital, but even before, um, you know, putting the person in the, uh, in, in the ambulance or before arriving to the hospital per se. And then there's all the care inside the hospital in the fifth link and the post cardiac care as well, because even after the cardiac arrest is reversed and there's a pulse, there's many tests to be done. We have to find the reason why there was a cardiac arrest and sometimes it's heart disease, actually 90% of the time there's underlying nine, uh, heart disease, but 10% of the time there's other causes that we need to find. Um, and the, the sixth and new link of the chain of survival is actually the recovery. And that's something that is very important. Um, so people that had a cardiac arrest, they have both physical sometimes disability and psychological disability as well. Um, and they need to be accompanied through this post cardiac care. And a lot of time going back to exertion, even though it's very stressful, is the right thing to do and having healthy habits if it was not already the case. Um, as uh, Jacqueline Simoneau mentioned, uh, it's never too early or too late actually to start healthy habits. And sometimes our healthcare system and a bit, a bit of a, a misnomer term because our healthcare system is very disease oriented. But if you take the health globally, then you address as well primary prevention with healthy life habits that prevents a lot of healthcare disease, healthcare issues and costs later on. Awesome, thank you so much. 
So uh, we've reached the end of our exciting live event. Uh, Dr. Joanie Rochette, Jacqueline Simoneau, Dr. Francois Deschamplain, and Dr. Scott Delaney, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you so much for your efforts in promoting the importance of CPR. We've been honored by your presence among us, and uh, we would just like to thank you again so much for being on this event with us. So next up, uh, we'd like to take this opportunity to advertise uh, our future events. So on October 13th, we're going to be joined by Dr. Hanoush, who's a general internal and critical care medicine physician, and also uh, Samuel Lorty, who's a survivor of cardiac arrest. So that'll be a great talk. Uh, on the same day, we're also going to be talking about the future of emergency cardiac care with uh, Dr. Chesksees, an emergency physician, Dr. Brooks, another emergency physician, Dr. Williams, an astronaut physician, and our very own Dr. Farhan Banji, pediatric critical care, pediatric emergency physician, and the chair of the Ross Steering Committee. And finally, on October 15th, we'll be receiving insights about cardiac arrest from Dr. Goldfarb, a cardiologist and cardiac intensivist, Dr. Deschamps who we have met today, and Dr. Thirsk, a Canadian astronaut and physician. And uh, if, if anyone's looking for more information on our live events, such as the dates, the links, the times, you can visit our social media platforms and our website. All the information is there. And uh, with that, thank you again, and we'll leave you with a, a short one-minute video explaining how to save a life. Uh, have a great evening, everyone, and uh, we hope that you had a blast at this event. In Canada alone, every 12 minutes, someone suffers from a cardiac arrest. If you don't do anything, they are going to die. In the next 60 seconds, we're going to teach you how to save a life. If you see someone lying unconscious, the first thing you want to do is check if they're responsive. If they are not responsive and not breathing or breathing abnormally, they are likely suffering from a cardiac arrest. Call 911, let them know that someone suffered from a cardiac arrest, send someone to find an AD if there's one nearby, and then, Start chest compressions. For chest compressions, find the center of the chest, put your dominant hand down, interlock your fingers, and push hard and push fast. Using an AD is really easy. You just apply the pads, turn on the machine, and follow the voice instruction. The machine will analyze the rhythm and tell you if a shock is recommended. 